All right, our subject tonight is dangers in Christian bookstores. And there are many dangers in Christian bookstores tonight. A couple of the very popular or influential Christian bookstores, Lifeway, operated by the Southern Baptist Convention and Family Christian uh, Bookstores. This is the one over in Milford there. And there are great dangers in Christian bookstores. God's people need to understand something about these dangers. But the Bible tells us that the end of the church age will not be characterized by a great spiritual revival and, uh, and a multiplicity of, of godly, wonderful Bible churches, but that the end of the church age will be characterized by apostasy. And that is a turning away from the faith that God has given us in the New Testament Scriptures. That's what the Apostle Paul prophesied in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. He warned that the time would come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And they, the ones he's talking about, are professing Christians. And they won't endure the sound doctrine that is given to us in the Word of God, but they'll turn away their ears uh, after their own lush. Shall they heap to themselves teachers? There's going to be heaps of teachers. And that's exactly what we see today in the bookstores. They're the huge bookstores full of teachers teaching. But they're not going to be the kind of teachers that will give the people uh, uh, the pure Word of God. They're going to be the kind of teachers that will scratch itching ears. Ears that are itching for a new kind of Christianity. And the Bible warns that they shall be turned, they shall turn away their ears from the truth. The devil cannot turn us away from the truth. We are the ones that turn away from the truth by rejecting the truth when we hear it. But then the devil can take control and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They, of their own free will, shall turn away their ears from the truth but they shall be turned unto fables. And at that point, the devil can take control of our lives when we reject the Word of God, when we sit there and say, no, I don't like that. And then the devil can take us wherever he wants to. Fables. The Christian bookstores today are full of fables. We're going to see some of those fables tonight. Even in Baptist bookstores, filled with fables. There's Mariolatry. One thing we're not going to mention tonight uh, in this presentation is uh, the, the exaltation of Romanism, the exaltation of people like Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa is exalted uh, as a great Christian, uh, even in Southern Baptist circles, even in evangelical type circles. Uh, consider her a great Christian because of the social work that she did in India and other places among lepers and whatnot. But Mother Teresa believed in a false gospel. Mother Teresa, one of the nuns of the uh, uh, Sisters of Charity, my wife and I interviewed uh, one of their nuns in Kathmandu, Nepal in the 1980s. And those nuns were there working with Mother Teresa's organization uh, in Kathmandu, and they were helping these people that were dying, these Hindus, and uh, assisting them. And I asked this nun, her name was Anne, Sister Anne, and I said, well, what do you do to prepare these people to die and to go out in eternity? And she said, well, we teach them to pray to their gods. They, uh, uh, Mother Teresa's organization doesn't even preach a Roman Catholic gospel. Just pray to your own gods. My friends, you, that's not a Bible-believing Christianity. And yet that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of confusion you'll find in the bookstores. Mariolatry. Spirit slaying, holy laughter, Christian hedonism, cultural liberalism, self-esteem, unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness, geological ages, all kinds of uh, uh, doctrines of evolution under the guise of believing in God. Theistic evolution is there. Contemplative mysticism. A rebel Jesus. Many of the Christian rockers believe that Jesus was a rebel, and they're, they think they're following in Jesus' footsteps when they're rebelling today. Uh, a non-judgmental God. All kinds of fables, just exactly what the Word of God prophesied 2,000 years ago. That's an amazing prophecy. The Bible warns that the last days will be a time of 
great spiritual deception. John warned about this. He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Don't be gullible. Don't just say, oh, it's a spirit. Oh, it's Jesus. Don't believe every spirit. But try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets are going out into the world. Two thousand years ago, that's what John had to say. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. How much more so in our day? And we're, we're told that it's going to be a time of great spiritual deception. There's another Bible truth we need to keep in mind today, and that is that God warns His people to test everything by the Scripture. We we read in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things, all things, not a few things, all things. The, The proper mindset to have as a Christian is to understand, excuse me, that this is the Word of God and that we live in a dark world full of lies and deception. We have a spiritual enemy, a very subtle, clever, wise spiritual enemy who desires to devour us, to deceive us, to lead us astray. And we have to take the Bible and test everything by the Word of God. That's the careful position in the Christian life. There's a third Bible truth that we need to keep in mind in our day and as we walk into a Christian bookstore, and that is the fact that spiritual error is clothed in the appearance of truth and righteousness. The devil doesn't come with a sign on his head. He doesn't come with a warning light blinking. He comes clothed, Jesus said. Uh, 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 he's a wolf, but clothed in sheep's clothing. And so we can't just believe what we see and just be gullible. People go to these big ecumenical conferences like the Promise Keepers conferences back in the 90s. And they go there and, oh, there's so many people there and, oh, they're singing about Jesus there. And these preachers are preaching uh, from some kind of Bible. They're preaching about Jesus. They're preaching about good kind of uh, Christian living. And, And people just go and they say, oh, isn't it wonderful But the Bible warns us that the devil is going to hide himself in the in the external clothing of of a sheep and that the devil's ministers come as ministers of righteousness and the devil himself comes as an angel of light. And so we have to keep in mind these tremendous Bible truths as we go into a Christian bookstore today. Paul warned in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 that For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So be very careful. And that's the one thing that most Christians today are not. And to be careful enough to protect ourselves, we have to to start out with a strong foundation of Bible knowledge. How can you test anything by the Bible if you don't know the Bible very well? You can't. This is a pretty big book. It takes some serious study to to get a hold of it and to get a hold of enough truth and to be able to interpret it properly enough to discern the wiles of the devil. One of the first things I did, the first thing I did in my Christian life by the grace of God was set myself out to learn the Bible so that I would never again be deceived. It's worth whatever effort it takes. God's people waste a lot of time with things that are not important. Year after year after year, we remain many times very ignorant of the most important thing in life, which is the Word of God. Tonight, we want to look at some dangers in Christian bookstores. There's the danger of Christian rock. There's the danger of the modern versions. There's the danger of new evangelicalism. It's positivistic philosophy. There's a danger of ecumenicalism. There's a danger of anti-fundamentalism. They are not our friends. There's a danger of the charismatic movement. There's a danger of the whole church growth movement, of Christian psychology, of contemplative prayer, inclusivism, the idea that uh, uh, people that do not name the name of Christ in this present life can somehow be saved. The emerging church... A movement, the Christian homosexuality that is becoming very popular, and then some miscellaneous 
heresies and heretics that I'd like to mention tonight as far as dangers in Christian bookstores. But one of the most prominent dangers is the Christian rock music over in the music section. The, I've really recently finished a book on the history of Christian rock music, going back to the 60s, tracing the history of it. And the title of the book is Raised by Wolves. And the author recognizes that all of this comes out of the world. And it's just a Christianized form of, of the world's music. And he, and he had the audacity to title this book, Raised by Wolves. I wonder if he's ever read the verse where Jesus warned that the devil will come as a wolf in sheep's clothing. But that's all Christian rock is. It's simply a merging of the world with Christ. And it's wrong. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So there's a choice we have to make. We can love the world, or we can love God, but we cannot love both. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. Because the Father is holy. It is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And that's all I'm going to say about the Christian rock music section of the bookstore uh, for this presentation. That it's simply a merging of the world with Christ. And it's illicit. It's wrong. It's extremely dangerous. Then there's the dangers in the Bible version section itself. The Bible section has great dangers today. Most of the versions that are sold in the average Christian bookstore today are the modern versions. The New International Version, the American Standard Version, the uh, whatever they might be today. And there's two great problems in the Bible uh, uh, section of a Christian bookstore today. First of all, Those modern versions are based on a corrupt Greek text. We know that the Bible, the New Testament was written in Greek 2,000 years ago. And that the Bibles we have today are translations of the Greek in the New Testament and Hebrew in the Old Testament and Aramaic. And uh, we have English translations. We have translations in all of the major languages of the world, all of them coming from Greek. In Nepal, we have a translation in the Nepali language coming from Greek. But the question is, what Greek text is that translation based upon? And all the modern versions are based upon a Greek New Testament that was created in the 19th century through modernistic principles of textual criticism, they called it. And they were humanistic, they were secular principles uh, uh, that were applied to the Bible, and they're wrong. Uh, modern textual criticism removes our questions. Dozens of entire verses from the Bible, such as these verses, completely takes them out of the, of the Bible. 147 other verses, portions. In fact, more than 2,800 words in the, the old uh, Greek received text that underlie that was the basis of all the old Protestant versions, are removed by modern textual criticism. That's the equivalent of the entire books of First and Second Peter removed from the Bible. There's a serious issue here. And many of these removals and many of these omissions and changes have great doctrinal implications. The first verse I look at to find the textual basis of a version is First Timothy 3.16 which says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Indeed, Jesus Christ was Almighty God. And He had no beginning. And when He was born as a virgin there in Bethlehem, that was not His beginning. He is eternal. And the eternal Son of God, He's the Creator of all things. And and Paul here, rightly, under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, calls Him God. But none of the modern versions do. And so there's tremendous doctrinal implications. But there's another serious error. Not only the textual corruption in the modern versions, but there is the translational corruption. 
the method of translation that the vast majority of the modern versions use is called dynamic equivalency. And instead of trying to uh, translate the words as exactly as, as possible, as exactly as possible into the, into the language, the receptor language is called, the translator has tremendous liberties. He feels like he has tremendous liberties to change things so that it will supposedly impact people today the same way it did when it was written. But the, but the bottom line is they make incredible changes to the Word of God. Here's a very popular version, the message. Now, the message is one of Rick Warren's favorite Bibles. The Saddleback Church, one of the largest churches in the world, Southern Baptist Church out in California. Uh, he had published the Purpose Driven Life, the Purpose Driven Church, one of the most influential men in the world. And this is, this, this is one of the Bibles, so-called, that he always preaches from and quotes in his books. Now, the King James Bible says, Blessed, in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, the message says, You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and His rule. Where did that come from? It's a figment of His imagination. It's an absolute corruption of the Word of God. You see, we don't have the authority to change God's Word. This is God's Word. Who am I to say I can change it, I can modify it, I can tinker with it? It's the lack of the fear of God in these end times that has that allowed men to be so audacious. Don't they fear? No, they don't. You say, well, that, that, that's just a, a off-the-wall kinds of translation. No one really takes that seriously. Yes, they do. It's been recommended by Rick Warren, by Billy Graham, by Warren Wiersbe, by J.I. Packer, by Joni Erickson Tata, by Bill Hybels, by Bill Gaither, by Chuck Swindoll, by Joyce Meyer, by John Maxwell, by Max Lucado, and we could go on and on. Widely recommended. Almost no one is sounding a warning against it in the, in the influential evangelical circles. And so there's great danger in the Bible section of a Christian bookstore. And then there's new evangelicalism, the philosophy which permeates all of the evangelical bookstores. New evangelicalism. And it's a philosophy, it's a movement that arose in the early 1950s, late 1940s. And it was a rejection of the old separatist fundamentalism that the fundamentalist battles of the first half of the 20th century. And men were taking a stand against heresy and theological modernism. They were called fundamentalists. And the new evangelicalism was a rejection of that. The, core, the term itself was coined by Harold Ockingay, at least that's what he claimed. And he said, new evangelicalism is different from fundamentalism in its repudiation of separatism. That is the heart and soul of new evangelicalism. If you can understand that, you can understand what new evangelicalism is. New evangelicalism has permeated popular Christianity. It is the working philosophy of the Southern Baptist Convention. If you can understand the error of New Evangelicalism, you can understand what's wrong with the uh, Southern Baptist Convention. And you can also understand what's wrong with the average independent Baptist church today that is buying into this philosophy. All of the big name, uh, 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 prominent Christian leaders today, writers, uh, uh, men that speak on the radio, on the television, on the internet, on the blogs, are new evangelical in principle, like David Jeremiah, and Louis Palau, and James Dobson, Chuck Colson, John Stott, Tony Campolo, Chuck Swindoll, Ch Charles Stanley, you name it. They're all new evangelical. They all have that same philosophy that they share. And the chief error of new evangelicalism is not the heresy that they preach, although many of them do preach heresies. But that's not the main problem. 
The main problem is the truth that they neglect and that they refuse to preach. And that's what God's people need to understand when we walk into a Christian bookstore or, or, or there's some movement like promise keepers that comes along. New evangelicalism focuses on the positive, uh, uh, mainly avoiding theological controversy. There are exceptions. See, there are certain theological controversies that are safe to deal with among evangelicals. But for the most part, they avoid. There are many unpopular subjects that they typically avoid. Ecclesiastical separation is taught in the Bible. It's a doctrine of the Bible. It's taught many, many times, many, many places. But they, but they never touch it. They don't deal with it. A fiery hell is mostly... Uh, uh, Totally neglected or else hell is redefined some way. Separation from the world. A major emphasis of the New Testament is neglected. New evangelicalism is a soft, non-offensive type of Christianity. Has a smiley face sort of on it. Very popular. Billy Graham has been the face of new evangelicalism all of his life, all of the days of his ministry, uh, beginning... When I was a little boy. And all of his life. And his influence has been incalculable. His message has been described as hard at the center and soft at the edges. In other words, there's the, he believes in the deity of Christ. He believes in, the, in some major doctrines like that, the Trinity. But all these so-called peripheral things, it doesn't really matter. And he doesn't even deal with it. Years ago, he said... Our evangelistic association is not concerned to pass judgment on any particular denomination. So we're not going to judge anything. We do not intend to get involved in the various divisions within the church. And that's been his working principle. And that is the working principle that has spread throughout evangelicalism. New evangelicals will preach against sin and error, but only in vague generalities. And the emphasis of evangelical books is the positive proclamation of the truth. Positive. Most of the books that you'll find in the average Christian bookstore are very man-centered, very soft. There are so many things they don't deal with. In contrast, the Bible is filled with warnings about false teachers, filled with warnings about false teachers, such as 2 Peter 2, 1, but there were false prophets also among you, the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. What a powerful warning. What a warning that ought to be uh, 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 shouted across the airway, Christian airwaves and television waves and, and throughout the bookstores. But there's silence. The Bible is filled with warnings about false gospels and false Christ and false spirits. So I can do 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul is warning about these false gospels, false Christs, false spirits. The Bible is filled with warnings about end time apostasy. Second Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And Paul's warning that the problem of false teachers is going to grow and the problem of apostasy is going to spread as the centuries pass. And you would think that this warning would be sounding out from the rooftops today by prominent Christian leaders, but there's great silence. The Bible is filled with commands to separate from error. Such as Romans sixteen seventeen, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. The doctrine that we've learned in the Word of God. Everything is to be tested by the doctrine of the Word of God. And avoid them. 
when we find someone that is not teaching the pure doctrine of the Word of God given by divine inspiration through the apostles and prophets of old, we are to mark them, identify them, and avoid them, stay away from them. And yet you won't hear that sounded out in Christian bookstores today. The Bible is filled with commands to separate from evil. To separate from evil. Ephesians 5.11 And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Take a stand against them. No fellowship. That's a very strict call to separation from evil. And yet you won't hear that kind of strictness and call to separation from evil in Christian bookstores today. The Bible is filled with warnings about an eternal fiery hell. Revelation 21.8, for example, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Powerful, powerful warning about hell and the fact that anyone that's not Saved through the blood of Christ. Anyone that dies in their sins uh, uh, will spend eternity there in that horrible place. And yet that is a theme that's very silent in the Christian bookstores today. The Bible's filled with exhortations to fear God. Hebrews twelve twenty eight and 29. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Godly fear. See, reverence and godly fear. Reverence, godly fear is reverence, but godly fear is more than reverence. There is a God that we deal with that literally is to be feared. And there, that, that theme is absent from Christian bookstores. The Bible is filled with exhortations about the holiness of God and how that should impact our Christian lives. Peter said that. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. What a far-reaching, uh, 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 what far-reaching implications that verse has. All manner of living be holy because God is holy. The Bible is filled with calls to strict Christian living, righteous Christian living. Titus 2, here we see the true definition of biblical grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What a strict call to righteous living and separation from every kind of sin and error. Strict call, and yet that kind of call, that that uh, that kind of call is missing in the preaching today in evangelicalism. The Bible is filled with calls of strict obedience to all of God's commands, such as Tim- Paul's exhortation to Timothy, First Timothy six fourteen, that thou keep this commandment without spot, without spot. Spot is a small thing, a detail. The theme song of evangelicalism as in, in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, charity. Paul didn't teach that. Paul said everything is important, Timothy. Keep everything without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we find in the Bible. But it's not what we find in evangelicalism today because of the evangelical, new evangelical philosophy. J.I. Packer was describing... The philosophy, the doctrine of one of the popular Christian writers, Richard Foster, in his book, Life with God. And J.I. Packer said, they are mild on sin, but firm on grace. But you know what? The Bible's both. The Bible is firm on sin as well as firm on grace. And if you don't understand God's hatred of sin, you'll never understand properly grace. It's a cheap grace. It's not a biblical grace. And because of the rejection of separation, today's Christian bookstores are filled with contradictions. They're syncretistic. 
There, uh, there, there, you'll find a variety of views. You can find a sound gospel in one book, and right next to it is a book with a false gospel. You can find a book that even uh, talks about hell a little bit sometimes. But then right next to it is a book questioning whether there is even an eternal fiery hell. And it's syncretistic, uh, and that's true with every doctrine. Syncretistic. All kinds of views uh, emerge together into one pot. And that is new evangelicalism. You have in Christian bookstores the danger of ecumenicalism. The ecumenical philosophy permeates uh, uh, evangelical Christianity today in the bookstores. Billy Graham has led the way in that. For decades, he has turned thousands upon thousands of his converts over into the hands of Roman Catholics and modernists, Seventh-day Adventists, you name it. All the walls of separation have been broken down. Billy Graham has led the way. If you visit his museum at Wheaton College, he has a hall of, uh, of evangelism, heroes of evangelism there. And two of those so-called heroes are a Catholic Pope, Gregory, and a Catholic Saint, so-called Francis of Assisi, both of whom preach false gospels. And that's the Billy Graham philosophy. Uh, uh, we don't separate from anything. Everybody's the same. All the denominations are the same. And that is the philosophy that is permeated evangelicalism today. That's the philosophy that comes across in the Christian bookstores. David Hesselgrave, in his book on missions and evangelism, said most evangelicals have accepted the Graham position that if the gospel is preached and people are one to Christ, the cause of world evangelization has been well served. doesn't matter what else you do. That philosophy is everywhere today. C.S. Lewis, who is dead, but his, his influence is great in evangelicalism. He promoted the ecumenical idea that all the different denominations are part of the big house of God. Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, Baptists, Pentecostals, everybody. Just a different rooms in the big house of God. It's not what the Bible teaches. Charles Colson, very influential. He says in recent decades, Catholic and Protestant doctrine has dramatically converged. John Maxwell, with the assistance of a half dozen girls from the orphanage, she founded the sisters, the missionary sisters of the Sacred Heart. And he's writing about that Roman Catholic work as if it's sound, as if it's, as if it's biblical. That's the ecumenical philosophy. Philip Yancey. You can find hospitals with names like St. Mary's, a Good Samaritan, Baptist Hospital. These institutions had their origins in a group of believers who believed healing was part of their calling as Christ's body. And so it's the ecumenical philosophy. The Catholics, the Baptists, they're all right. Everybody's right. Jim Cimbala. Jesus prayed for all His people to become one. Evangelical churches, charismatic, Baptist churches, Lutheran. God recognizes none of these artificial labors. The ecumenical philosophy, Max Lucado. My faith has been supplemented by people of other groups. Max Lucado's Church of Christ. But he says, my faith has been supplemented by Pentecostal and Anglican, Southern Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic. They've all contributed to my Christian faith. The ecumenical philosophy. Charles Swindoll. He says, I'm not charismatic. However... I don't feel it is my calling to shoot great uh, volleys of theological artillery at my charismatic brothers and sisters. In other words, uh, let's get along. The ecumenical philosophy, Elizabeth Elliot, and a very prominent uh, Christian leader because she was married to a missionary that was martyred by the Alka Indians, and uh, Jim Elliot, and she herself was a missionary. But a radically ecumenical in her philosophy. She spoke at the Franciscan University at Steubenville in July 1989. That is here in Ohio. She spoke at a Catholic charismatic conference at Notre Dame in 1998. Her book, Taking Flight, uh, it, it, uh, uh, promotes her confusion about salvation itself. She says, those who receive Christ 
are not are given not an instant kingdom, but the right to become children of God. It does not say God makes them instant children of God. It says He gives them the right to become. That's the doctrine of a gradual salvation over a long period of time, through sacraments, through faith, through this, through that, uh, growing in salvation, not an instant uh, birth, a new birth. Confusion about salvation itself. The ecumenical movement creates that kind of confusion. Uh, Elizabeth Elliot is an Episcopalian. Robert Weber, a goal for evangelicals is to seek unity in the midst of diversity. This perspective will allow us to see Catholic, Orthodox and Protestant churches as various forms of the one true church, the ecumenical philosophy. And so the ecumenism uh, permeates everything today in evangelicalism and in Christian bookstores. Not surprisingly, there's the danger of anti-fundamentalism that permeates these bookstores. The average Christian bookstore is no friend of a fundamentalist, biblicist church. Jerry Bridges, areas in which we practice legalism, building fences, he's talking about separation from from, uh, other types of Christians, build fences against false doctrine, expecting attendance at church meetings, he calls that legalism. The Bible says uh, 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 to to not avoid, what does the Bible say? Do not forsake. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. The matter of some is. So much more as you see the day approaching, the day of Christ, as apostasy increases. And for a preacher to preach that is not any kind of legalism. Is obedience to God by a blood-washed believer legalism? That's nonsense. But that's what he's saying. He's an enemy. The old bogey of worldliness. That's not an old bogey. The Bible says that those that love the world do not love God. They're adulterers and adulteresses. That's not an old bogey. That's the Bible. The length of a man's hair. Well, if the length of a man's hair didn't matter, why does the Bible talk about it? It talks about the length of a woman's hair, too. The controllers. And there are controllers in churches. I've oftentimes warned about manipulative pastors that, that demand unquestioning loyalty. That's cultish. God, the only unquestioning loyalty we give to anyone is Almighty God and Jesus Christ and His, His infallible Word. Not to some fallible man. But the Bible also says that God has given leaders in the churches and we are to obey them that have the rule over us. And as they follow the Word of God and as they follow the Spirit of God, we follow them. And that's proper. That's doing things decently and in order in the house of God. But he calls that controlling. Those that have all the issues buttoned down and have cast down opinions. Well, if you study the Bible and you walk with Christ, he will give you cast iron opinions about things that are right and things that are wrong. That's why he gave the Bible. Not to make us wishy-washy, but to give us some solid uh, opinions about the truth in this dark world. See, these are enemies. Enemies of what we stand for. Chuck Swindoll, when grace is present, there is an absence of Bible bashing and dogmatism. He's an enemy. We could give many other examples of that. But there's the danger of the charismatic movement. One of the prominent movements today in Christianity is the charismatic movement. And the And there are many dangers in Christian bookstores. One of the great dangers is the charismatic movement. And the, the way that the charismatic movement has infiltrated evangelicalism today, and even in many times the Baptist bookstores, Southern Baptist bookstores, you'll find many titles written by charismatics. In fact, sometimes there's entire sections devoted to that or else their books are intermingled uh, just here and there throughout the bookstore. Jack Hayford has been called the gold standard of Pentecostalism by Christianity Today. He's supposed to be a very 
Bible-centered Pentecostal. And yet I heard him preach in 2000 in Indianapolis, or I'm sorry, in St. Louis in 2000 at a big ecumenical conference. And I, I took this picture and he said that his daughter came to him one day and said, well, daddy, I, uh, I'm very concerned about my tongue speaking. She said, I don't think it's any kind of language at all. And he said, well, don't worry about that. He said, when you were little, you had to learn how to talk, didn't you? And you started talking gibberish before you could talk. And that's the way it is with tongues. My friend, that's not Bible. That's nonsense. You can't learn to do a miracle. Uh, Tongue speaking in the Bible was an absolute divine miracle. One of the most amazing miracles uh, in all of history. To be able to stand up and immediately, fluently speak a language that you've never learned. What an amazing miracle. That's just gibberish. It's nonsense. He said that he was driving along in his car one day and uh, driving past the Catholic church. And God spoke to him and said, don't judge my church. Well, I don't know what God it was, but it certainly wasn't the God of the Bible, to, uh, the, which tells us to mark and identify heretics and false gospels. We've written an entire book about this, the Pentecostal charismatic movement, its history and its error. And then there's the danger of the church growth movement. Church growth. We have gurus, church growth gurus like Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church out in California. And Bill Hybels, senior pastor of Willow Creek Church on the west side of Chicago. Huge, massive churches. Largest, some of the largest churches in the world. And one of the characteristics of the church growth movement is the uh, soft message to downplay the so-called non-essentials for the sake of attracting a crowd. Rick Warren. I visited that church one Sunday morning, one of the early services, uh, as a piece of research. And I took this picture of Rick Warren back when he used to wear Hawaiian church shirts. I like his shirt a lot. But he said, I'm not going to get into a debate over the non-essentials. Why be divisive? Non-essentials, what are they? No such thing in the Bible. Not everything in the Bible has equal uh, uh, importance. But nothing in the Bible is a non-essential that we can just throw away for the sake of so-called unity. Willow Creek, they say there's no fire and brimstone here. No Bible thumping, just positive, uh, witty messages. That's the church growth message which they uh, captured from New Evangelicalism. They promote the music is neutral philosophy in order to draw crowds through the pop music, the world's music. Rick Warren says no particular style of music is sacred. Saddleback Church has nine different worship venues on a Sunday morning. And you can take your choice. It's democratic. Uh, People's rights there about music. Whatever music suits your fancy. You can go to the Country Line Dance Dancing Worship segment. Or you can go to the Island Hula, you can learn how to do a little hula in the, in that worship venue. The non-judgmental doctrine permeates the church growth movement is prominent within that movement. One of their fundamental platforms. We're not supposed to judge. Rick Warren says, God warns us over and over not to criticize, compare, or judge one another. In fact, Jesus said we're to judge righteous judgment. And uh, the church growth gurus, they promote all, all, all sorts of modern versions. Just a smorgasbord. Just take your pick. Pick the one that you like the best. Rick Warren typically quotes from several different versions in any one message. It's confusing. There's no way that you could follow along. There's no way that you could try to find out whether he's using the Scripture properly or not. Because no matter what Bible you bring, he's going to quote nine different other ones. And that is one of the principles of the church growth movement. There's a danger of Christian psychology. Christian psychology, a movement led by James Dobson over the last several decades and has permeated evangelical Christianity, permeated the bookstores uh, uh, with this philosophy. The self-esteem heresy right at the heart of it. Uh, uh, James Dobson 
said that lack of self-esteem is a threat to the entire human family. Oh, I thought it was sin. Oh, no, it's lack of self-esteem. It affects children, adolescents, the elderly, all socioeconomic levels of society, and each race and ethnic culture. Everybody's affected by this lack of self-esteem. That's our problem that we have to solve. That's his fundamental doctrine. Because his teaching focuses on psychology, which they have borrowed from the world, from the secular psychologists, from Freud and Carl Rogers and, 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 and the different psychologists, uh, uh, rather than the solid preaching of the Word of God, all denominations are attracted to him. In fact, he has a very close relationship with the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, one of the issues of their children's magazine, Clubhouse, they featured Mother Teresa as the great Christian. Here's James Dobson himself on the cover of a Catholic magazine, New Covenant. And inside of that same magazine, it had a prayer to Mary. Mary, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Mary can't hear our prayers. Mary has nothing to do with our salvation. And there's James Dobson right in the middle of that. Instead of condemning it, he's there smiling in the midst of it. David Siemens, another popular Christian psychologist, his book, Healing Damaged Emotions, has sold uh, countless copies, great influence. He says Satan's most powerful psychological weapon is a low self-esteem. That's what these guys believe. Self-esteem is our problem, lack of self-esteem. He takes people into the past to find out the essence of uh, 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 why they are like they are today and to delve into the hidden things of the past and go back there and heal the memories uh, uh, through new age techniques like visualization and guided imagery and dream analysis. That's Jungianism. Venting of emotions. We're not supposed to vent our emotions. We're supposed to control. We're not supposed to just blurt out everything we think. We're supposed to be in control of ourselves by the Holy Spirit. We have the flesh, the old man, everything that comes to mind, we're not supposed to blurb it out. This is all new age. The things that are borrowed from new age and from secular psychology. Dr. Larry Crabb is another very prominent Christian psychologist. And his heresies include self-esteem and Freud's unconscious mind and unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness as a means of building up your own self-esteem. He claims that salvation and sanctification through God's Word and God's Spirit aren't enough. No, we all need some psychological counseling. Self-esteem, Christian counseling, Christian psychology movement. Other popular psychology authors are uh, uh, Frank Minrith, Paul Murr, the Minrith Murr Clinic, Les Carter, uh, Selwyn Hughes, Gary Collins, many, many, many others. Great dangers in uh, Christian bookstores through this psychology movement. And then there's the danger in the contemplative prayer movement, which is now, right now, before our very eyes, permeating Christianity, evangelicalism. It's attempt to commune with God experientially beyond the pages of the Bible, uh, directly with God through various practices that are borrowed, that are brought uh, out of the old Roman Catholic Dark Ages, the monastic system. And this contemplative mysticism is bringing evangelicals ever closer to Rome, something that's been happening now for many decades. At the same time, it's bringing Rome ever closer to the pagan religions such as Hinduism or Buddhism. And it's bringing all of them together closer to the New Age. It's an amazing thing. And yet these popular publishers are promoting this title after title after title coming off of the presses. These are practices like centering prayer, which involves using a mantra to empty yourself of conscious thoughts to, to, to go down inside of yourself and to 
uh, 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 meet God there experientially, uh, have a union with God down inside of your own being. Visualization prayer to to put yourself mentally into a biblical scene through the power of imagination. It's even called fantasy prayer, and that's a good name for it because it is indeed fantasy. And it's a recipe for demonic possession, my friends, to, to open yourself up and to go, let your imagination just take over in that way. There's the Jesus prayer, which consists of repeating a phrase or even one word over and over again, maybe all day long. A phrase like, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. And uh, can you imagine standing in front of the, of the Lord and just uh, saying something over and over again? What kind of nonsense is that? In fact, Jesus forbade repetitious prayer like the pagans do. Mindless prayer. The Buddhists. Many times I go out to one of the most popular Buddhist shrines in the world in Kathmandu and I watch this Buddhist go around and around the shrine and they're, they're saying their prayers and they're counting their prayer beads. But it's just the same thing over and over and over and over. And that's what they have done is borrowed these practices from the pagans. Contemplative mysticism. One of the great promoters of that is Richard Foster. His book, Celebration of Discipline is uh, prominently uh, sold in the Christian bookstores. And he's promoting all of these Catholic mystics and their practices. He promotes men like Thomas Merton, who was both a Catholic priest and a Buddhist monk. That's what he called himself. And he uh, believed that all men eventually will be saved. He believed that God is everything. God is even this table down here. God is this pulpit. And he went to Sri Lanka and worshipped at a Buddhist shrine there. Images, idols of Buddha. And he said, I don't know when in my life I've ever had such a sense of beauty and spiritual vitality. Deluded, deceived man. And yet promoted by these evangelicals. Promoted in Southern Baptist seminaries. Years ago, I went and visited the campus of Golden Gate Seminary in California near San Francisco, Southern Baptist Seminary. And the, and the bookshelves were full of this kind of stuff. Books, uh, Christian bookstores stocking a wide variety of Catholic mystics like Brother Lawrence and his practice of the presence of God and St. Francis of Assisi, St. Ignatius, one of the founders of the Jesuits, Thomas Akempis, Henry Nguyen, who also was a universalist and believed that everybody would be saved, John Michael Talbot, Teresa of Avila, and the contemplative mysticism now that is permeated evangelicalism is being promoted in these Christian bookstores. Inclusivism is another great danger in the Christian bookstores today. The doctrine that men somehow can be saved without naming the name of Christ in this present life, without personally putting their faith in Christ. Billy Graham has taught this for decades. He said in an interview in 1997 with Robert Schuller, whether they come from the Muslim world, or the Buddhist world, or the Christian world, or the non-believing world, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been Called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus. But Jesus, the Bible says that there is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. The Bible says, Jesus said, I come, came not to condemn men because men are already condemned. And every man that dies without uh, uh, being born again, Jesus said you must be born again. The Bible's very plain about that. We'll, go, uh, we'll spend an eternity in hell. And yet these men questioning that and allowing for salvation apart from, from the name of Christ. Max Lucado believes that. In his recent book, uh, On the Shelves Now, Max on Life, there's a question. It's the question, it's answers to questions. And one of the questions is, what about the people who have never heard of God? Uh, will God punish them? His answer is, no, He will not. Heaven's population includes 
throngs of people who learned the name of their Savior when they awoke in their eternal home. Where does he get that? Did he have a divine revelation or something? If he did, it was from the devil because it contradicts what the Bible plainly says. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, uh, tells us very plainly that there's a before and after of salvation. And the Bible tells us very plainly the condition of every individual that is not born again. In Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Before we were saved, what were we? Dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, What is their condition? They're controlled by the devil. They're children of the devil. The Bible goes on in verse 12 and says that at that time, that time before we were born again, we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. There is no hope apart from faith in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said we're to preach the gospel to every creature. Why are we doing that? Why can't I just stay at home in America, where I, which I love more than any other country in the world, in spite of the wickedness and what's happened to it? It's still the best country in the whole world as far as I'm concerned. I'd just as soon stay here and spend the last years, whatever I have in my life, here in this place instead of the God-forsaken place like Nepal. Why, if they can be saved without naming the name of Christ, why all the sacrifice? Why? Because there is no other way of salvation. The Bible's as clear about that as it is anything. These men are heretics. Richard Mao, president, Fuller Theological Seminary, recently said that uh, when a rabbi friend of his died, he held out the hope that when he saw Jesus, he would acknowledge that it was him all along and that Jesus would welcome him into the heavenly realm. Clark Pinnock says, Faith in Jesus as the Savior of the world leaves room for us to be open and generous to other religious traditions. I welcome the Salva Siddhanta literature of Hinduism, Japanese Shinshu, Buddha as a righteous man. Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Mohammed as a prophet. What confusion. C.S. Lewis is one of the men that's uh, guilty, uh, uh, responsible for this kind of heresy sweeping through evangelicalism. C.S. Lewis uh, uh, said that sincere followers of pagan religions can be saved without personal faith in Jesus Christ. Dallas Willard. He said it's possible for someone who does not know Jesus to be saved. Rob Bell, in his recent book, Love Wins, says the love of God will melt every hard heart and even the most depraved sinners will eventually give up their resistance and turn to God. Where do you get that, Rob? Not from the Bible, from the figment of your own heretical imagination. What heresies permeate the bookstores? There's the danger also of the emerging church. The emerging church is a name for a new approach to Christianity, to church, to church work because the times are changing. And because society is changing, the church, churches need to change. It's just the latest wing of the broad tent of new evangelicalism. All these things can be traced back 50, 60 years ago. And the renunciation of separatism. The emerging church, Brian McLaren, says it's pharisaical to view the Bible as God's rule book, God's answer book. Donald Miller uh, he talks about how he wants liberty to drink and to run around with the, with the, with the world's crowd and watch raunchy movies or whatever. And he believes that God gives him that liberty. David Foster, a renegade's guide to God. We won't be told what to do or commanded how to behave. Now there you go. That was my theme song before I was saved. Erwin McManus, the barbarian way. He's a pastor. He says those in the barbarian way do not focus on requirements. They're not required to keep in step. And there is no force conformity. 
<coughs> but these men are great enemies of a church like this. Mark Driscoll, a pastor, senior pastor of Mars Hill Church in Seattle. I am theologically conservative and culturally liberal, loving the world. The church hosts champagne dance parties and has beer brewing lessons for the men. And, and they sit around and discuss the lessons of R-rated movies and such. Rob Bell, he says, The apostles did not claim to have the absolute word from God. The emerging church, Dallas Willard. Why is it that we look upon salvation as a moment that began our religious life instead of the daily life we receive from God? Well, why is it, Dallas? Because the Bible says you must be born again. And a birth does not happen over a long period of years. That's why, Dallas, the confusion about salvation itself, the danger of the emerging church, and then the danger of Christian homosexuality. Now, the Bible says homosexuality is a sin. And it's not the unforgivable sin. It's a sin like adultery. It's a, it's a fornicating type of sin. It's a sexual sin. It's a perversion and corruption of, of God's will for man in the area of, the, of our sexual lives. And it can be forgiven. And the Bible says that the members of the church at Corinth, some of them had been homosexuals before they were saved. And they were saved and their lives were changed. And we, 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 we invite homosexuals to come and hear the gospel. They need the gospel as much as any adulterer out there does. But the fact is that God commands sinners to repent of their sin. To, to turn around, to face in a different direction, and to look to God for the power to change from a sinful way of life to a righteous and a holy way of life. But that's not what these people believe. They believe that God made homosexuals like they are, that God is happy with homosexuals like they are, that there's nothing whatever that they need to repent of. Chris C.A. In the book, Faith of My Fathers, he is a third generation Baptist pastor. And he says, churches are not called to be moral police. And we should approach homosexuals without condemnation. Donald McCullough, he says, condemning homosexuality feels natural. Yeah, yeah, it feels natural for us to condemn homosexuals. But in a world turned upside down by grace, we must distrust whatever feels natural. Don Kimball, Dan Kimball, they like Jesus, but not the church. What he means is they like Jesus, but they don't like those old fashioned Bible believing churches. He says we can no longer just regurgitate what we've been taught about homosexuality. Homosexual attraction is not something young people choose to have, as is often erroneously taught from many pulpits. Choose. Yes, sin is not something we choose. It comes from out of our old nature. I didn't choose to lust after I did choose. But I mean, the, the lust of man, the sexual lust, come out of our old nature. And they're more perverted in sometimes, uh, some cases than others. But they come out of our fallen old nature. But God didn't create us fallen like that. Philip Yancey. When it gets to particular matters of policy, the ordaining gay and lesbian ministers. Well, let's see now. Should we ordain uh, homosexuals that have never repented of that? He says, I'm confused. Like a lot of people. He's confused because he doesn't believe the Bible. The danger of Christian homosexuality. There's entire denominations Homosexual denominations, the metropolitan churches. And then we conclude with our warning about dangers in Christian bookstores with some miscellaneous heresies and heretics. In Christian bookstores. C.S. Lewis is one of the most even one of the most influential men in Christianity today. And yet he was a heretic. A very serious heretic. He had no biblical testimony of salvation. If you read his, uh, his testimony, his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, there's no biblical testimony of salvation there. 
It's just changing from being an atheist to being a believer in God. He denied total depravity of man. He denied Christ's substitutionary blood atonement. Uh, He believed in theistic evolution. He denied the eternal fiery hell. He believed that men could be saved without personal faith in Christ. C.S. Lewis, Norman Vincent Peale. Both of these men are dead, but their influence continues to be massive today. Norman Vincent Peale said, It's not necessary to be born again. You have your way to God. I have my way. Norman Vincent Peale. He said, People are inherently good. Every human being is a child of God. Robert Schuller follows in Norman Vincent Peale's footsteps. They, are, they were members of the same denomination. And Robert Schuller has redefined every major doctrine of the Bible according to his self-esteem theology. He says, sin is the loss of self-esteem. Hell is the loss of pride that follows separation from God. And he said to call a person a sinner will offend his self-esteem. He said that's a very bad thing to do. Brennan Manning, very prominent in the bookstores, his books, a former Catholic priest. He has not renounced Rome. He was kicked out of the priesthood. He says, I develop a nasty rash around people who speak as if uh, mere scrutiny of the Bible's pages will reveal precisely how God thinks and what God wants. Well, how else would we know what God thinks? Are the trees going to tell us? You can learn some things from the trees and from the stars. Natural revelation. But we can't find out what God thinks from that. Only from His own revelation. The Bible. These men are enemies of the Word of God. Bruce Wilkinson. The prayer of Jabez. It was a great phenomenon a few years ago. He said, I want to teach you how to pray a daring prayer. And God always answers. I believe it contains the key to a life of extraordinary favor with God. A key that will unlock everything that you want. And a, a whole slew of, of materials uh, were sold to bank on that key. The prayer of Jabez. And the bookstores are full of this kind of junk, of course, that they used to make money with. John Eldridge, wild at heart. He said you might even need to give up going to church or reading the Bible for a while. There's a good recipe for spiritual disaster. He said, beware of the doctrine cop. Beware of the doctrine cop. The the Christian that says, this is the Word of God, I need to test everything, buy it. No, we need more doctrine cops. Uh, Wise ones, Bible-based ones, not nutcases. But we need more people that are zealous for doctrinal purity, not less. John Piper, very prominent, influential His book, Desiring God, has influenced so many. And many independent Baptists today are being influenced by John Piper. His Christian hedonism doctrine. He says, The desire to be happy is a proper motive for every good deed. And if you abandon the pursuit of your own joy, if you abandon the pursuit of your own joy, you cannot love man or please God. And so... My happiness is wrapped up in my pursuit of God. It's an extremely dangerous thing. And when I talked with Peter Masters in London, Ontario, in February, he he was warning about this. He was very grieved about John Piper's influence. See, Peter Masters is an old-time Calvinist. In the, he, he pastors the church that Charles Spurgeon made famous, the Metropolitan Tabernacle of London, England. And he stands in that old reformed, which we do not, we do not believe, but he stands in that old reformed path, which John Piper does not. He's a new kind. He's changed all of that. Very dangerous man. John Piper's grown very close in recent years with Rick Warren and with Mark Driscoll out in Seattle. William Young, William Paul Young, the shack. We've mentioned that this week, but an extremely popular Influential book. It's all about the redefinition of Almighty God. God the Father is depicted in the book as a black woman 
who loves rock and roll. And the Shaq's God is a cool God that doesn't judge anybody. He doesn't have any rules that he expects you to follow. He doesn't exercise wrath against sin. He doesn't uh, put obligations on people. On page 182, the Shaq God says, Those that love me come from every system that exists. Buddhists, Mormons, Muslims, I have no desire to make them Christian. Christian bookstores, one of the most dangerous places spiritually in the world today. Wish I could preach this message in every independent Baptist church in the world. I can't. <laughs> but I'm thankful that I can preach it here. I'm thankful there's church, still churches that want to be warned. They want godly warning. The Bible says the simple believeth all things. But the prudent looketh well to his going. And so, dangers in Christian bookstores. The Bible warns us that the end of the church age will be characterized not by revival, but by great apostasy and spiritual deception. And the Bible urges us to test everything carefully by His Word. And the Bible warns us that spiritual error will be clothed in the appearance of truth and righteousness. Wolves, but in sheep's clothing. 